Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, the state of the nation continues to be in the spotlight and we are joined today by Asoko Besekra, the Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka. The LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index gained 19 basis points in June. Nielsen's Managing Director Sharan Pant analyzes the turnaround in business sentiment. And in our final segment, LMD's columnist Sharan Fernando provides some insights into Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program Benchmark, I'm Savitri Rodrigo. The Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka, Asoka Obesekar, joins us today to discuss and to continue our discussion on the state of the nation. So some of the questions we will be posing to him are, has sufficient progress been made in the uh, political arena in tackling bribery and corruption? Uh, do you feel that the government's efforts to ensure transparency in the parliamentary select committee hearings on the terror attacks have been adequate? And also, how can citizens get involved in the political process other than in casting their votes to make sure that their interests are safeguarded? So, Asuka, thank you so much for joining us today. And as you look at Sri Lanka right now, how do you perceive the state of the nation? Well, at the moment, uh, given the unfortunate events of April this year, and even looking back at uh, the also unfortunate events of October of last year, the state of the nation seems quite fragile, both the politics and the people, um, which is an unfortunate area of concern. And uh, I think underscoring this, however, we should also remember that uh, there is a great deal of um, strength within our people. We have seen very difficult times in the past and being resolute at this time is going to be very important to ensure that we get out of any problems that we face right now. So Sri Lanka scored 38 in the latest Corruption Perception Index, bringing us to uh, a ranking of 89 out of 180 countries. Do you think sufficient progress has been made in bribery and corruption when it comes to bribery and corruption in the political arena? Well, I think um, when we look back not only at the Corruption Perception Index uh, of last year but beyond, I think the challenge that we see is that there hasn't really been a big shift. And what that in illustrates is that the perception of public sector corruption is largely unchanged as well. And so the way in which a citizen has to go and engage with um, a public authority potentially that there has not been a fundamental change in, 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 in that engagement and hence why uh, we have all, we've always hovered in the same area irrespective of the fact that we have a government with an anti-corruption mandate. However, I would go one step further in saying that I mean we have seen small areas where light has shone through. We saw the, um, the arrest of the ch uh, President's Chief of Staff um, uh, I, uh, with 20 million rupees from an Indian businessman who had tipped off Siobhok. But beyond that, there are some really, really fundamental issues which really have lost a great deal of public trust. First amongst them is this issue of MP bribery or alleged bribery in October last year. Uh, Transparency International Sri Lanka formally filed a complaint with all of the different evidence, audio recordings and the like, showing that the this what, what can only be called like the playbook of bribery and corruption, which was there, captured with audio. And yet we are not seeing any movement on holding uh, anyone uh, to account on something like this. So it illustrates the resistance that is faced and really CIRBOC, the Commission to Investigate Allegations of Bribery or Corruption, they need to ensure that they take those things forward to build public trust in institutions like their own. And it's only through that sort of um, friction that comes with opposing authority that public trust will actually be built. So who should actually be taking a stand when it comes to uh, holding these people accountable 
for bribery and corruption? Well, under the law, um, any issue connected to the Bribery Act, which, is, which has the main bribery and corruption offences, and anything connected to the Declaration of Assets and Liabilities Act, it has to be anchored in the Commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption. So that is the one-stop shop. However, um, independence um, can be provided legally, but we also need people who have a spirit of really going and confronting and challenging and holding people to account to drive those institutions as well. So, I mean, that's the key thing, because like a light switch, you can't switch on independence. It comes through really challenging and having that sort of spirit of ac accountability. What is the role that general citizenry can play? Well, in that sense, the general citizenry needs to keep pushing and asking for greater accountability. And I mean, citizenry does also. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, a common thing that is heard. But I would maybe distinguish between, um, let's say, issues connected to bribery, which citizens really do stand up against and voice themselves against compared to corruption. And corruption is a little bit more nuanced because corruption uh, includes bribery but many other things. And when we look at things around the, uh, the abuse of um, state resources, the abuse of position to unfairly benefit other individuals for private gain, um, some people like to sit there and say that is wrong. But then when they are the... But then they may also go and ask for... Uh, unfair benefits to be garnered on them individually. So citizens also need to realize that they complain sometimes, and we all do, about the situation, but we are also sometimes the drivers of the political culture that we actually have. In your opinion, uh, have the government's efforts been adequate uh, to ensure transparency in the parliamentary select committee hearings on the terror attacks, do you think? Well, I think it's been encouraging that the select committee is hearing evidence publicly. Not only for this select committee, but all select committees, the default should be things should be open to the public. There will be times when sensitive information that, to, um, that sh should not be in the public domain, but that should be the exception as opposed to the norm. So the fact that the select committee is reporting publicly is encouraging. And I think this is the important thing that we're also seeing is that real accountability finally only comes through in when information is in the public domain. Having things behind closed doors just does not build trust in the same way that being accountable publicly does. So what more do you think could be done to improve transparency and accountability? So, from the perspective of select committees, for example, have those in public. Let the media be there. Let the uh, uh, let citizens be there. I know that there's always the concern that, my goodness, can we trust the way in which some person may interpret what we're saying? But have it in public, because even with when we look at things like the Bond Commission, ultimately, the fact that there was a sense of momentum at the time during the Bond Commission came from the fact that the media were there and able to report it. And, and then the public became a part of the conversation of hearing what happened yesterday, what happened the day before. So that is the key, key element in driving accountability. Un unfortunately, if the institutions that are supposed to finally, you know, prosecute people and hold people accountable fail, at least the information is in the public domain so that the public can discern the truth even if the institutions fail them. But the president himself said that by having these open to uh, or putting the information out to the public, uh, sensitive information is also going out to the public. How do you balance the two? And this is a time when you also have to sort of um, rely on the state to make those judgment calls. However, um, the one thing I can say with some certainty is that people who have conflicted interests should not be the individuals who should be articulating those points strongest. And so that's where you know, we need strong bureaucracy to, make, um, uh, to, uh, um, to speak up on those issues. But certainly when it comes to issues where people have, um, uh, have to also at times protect themselves, then they cannot be entrusted with making those sorts of decisions. Well, we are into an election year. What do you think are the costs and the benefits of having an election in this year? 
Well, I think um, uh, as an organization which also is engaged in election monitoring, um, one principal area to look at is the abuse of state resources during elections. Let's face it, contesting an election is a financially illogical decision. So on one side, it is essential that the public have greater understanding of what actually drives politicians to contest their elections because it is a financially logical proposition. So um, one thing that we have strongly advocated for is the proactive disclosure of asset declarations of the elected officials. We've seen seven members of parliament from across political, um, the, across the spectrum coming forward with their asset declarations. So it will be very encouraging to see more and more people proactively release that information into the public domain and say, we want to change this political culture and we've already seen some first steps there. But looking at the actual election itself, a key element to look at is the fact that now the levers of power of central government is more associated with one faction. At local government, we can see it more associated with a different political faction. So are there going to be a players at using state resources to um, uh, support and back up um, election campaigns through the use of vehicles, through the use of buildings, sometimes even through the use of staff? This is a an important thing to see and monitor and really pay attention to and report and the police and the elections commission are going to have quite a busy time of it I suspect. Apart from casting their votes, how can citizens be more involved in the political process to ensure that their interests are safeguarded by their representatives in office? One of the most important things is that when we look at our own culture, we see the way let's say how parents even when they have very low incomes, end up going to extraordinary lengths to educate their children, give their children opportunities. I think at this next election, we have to start thinking about aspirations. Who actually has the aspirations of the next generation of this country truly at heart? Because any reflection and looking at parliament as it currently stands is a clear indication of the fact that our parliament as it is, is actually just a reflection of a generation that is now no longer at the cutting edge and the next generation has to come through. So who is going to provide that opportunity for the next generation? Who values the next generation as an asset for this country and wants to give the next generation an opportunity of moving forward? That is the person that needs to be supported at this next election. So we'll continue this discussion after a commercial break, Asoka. Time for a commercial break. On the other side, Asoka Obeseker gives us his take on what reforms are needed to ensure good governance in the public sector, as well as how recent events in the political arena have impacted Sri Lanka's international standing. Stay with us. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. What on earth are you doing? I'm making money! You're crazy! Crazy for money! Oh. 10,000 steps done! Who oh, the man! I do it every single day! Show me the money! So, you run 10,000 steps every day, huh? You must be fit. <laughs> Some days I do 20,000. <000. laughs> <laughs> ah! Thank you for staying with Benchmark. We are discussing the state of the nation with Asoka Obesekar, the Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka. Asuka, so we're back to our second half of Benchmark. 
what do you think needs to be done to ensure that all citizens are treated equally from a human rights perspective? Let me put this into perspective. So to speak, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the Government of the United Kingdom noted that the human rights situation in Sri Lanka was mixed in 2018. Citing intercommunal uh, tensions, the slow delivery of key reconciliation commitments, delays in introducing new human rights compliant counter-terrorism legislation, and also a, a stalled transitional justice process. So, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that everyone is treated equally? I think if I had to pick on one particular thing, it has to be access to justice. The need for equality before the law and the need for timely justice is an essential component within our, rule, uh, our aspirations for having a country which upholds the rule of law. At the moment, we see how the average criminal case takes ten and a half years to complete. We see the way in which people are, who are victims need to negotiate with people who are basically engaging in criminal endeavours because of the lack of faith in the criminal justice system. This is having an enormously eroding effect on our social fabric. And there are so many individuals, be it in government, be it in the legal fraternity and across the board, who really need to stand up for this. Because this is really what is letting so many people down and this is what is actually just ensuring honest people have to turn to dishonest means just to survive. So if, if there's anything, that is it. And we see that across the board. I mean, like even when it comes to, when we're speaking about justice, we initially think about the criminal justice system, but look at the way in which, uh, how just is the way in which we even get our children into schools, you know? I mean, right from the outset, there are so many gatekeepers and goliaths that have to be placated to ensure that, some, that your child can just get a state education. So these are enormous concerns, but the access to justice is a crucial, crucial thing. So what reforms are required to ensure good governance in public sector institutions? Well, I think... Um, there needs to be a real introspection on how bureaucracy functions. I think sometimes the challenge when we see public discourse is that we don't also understand um, the incentives within bureaucracy. And if anyone actually um, is inclined to, they should take a look at the establishment code. And that is the real guidebook of how a, state, a civil servant has to function. And you start realizing that these are really anchored in a time gone by. So it hasn't really moved with the times. So looking at the way in which uh, bureaucracy is organized and the rules by which bureaucracy have to function within, I'd also say, and this is a connected point, look at information sharing. Now we have seen in April the enormous, enormous issues that tie in with the failures of information sharing. But that's within the security network. However, at a, at a more elementary level, we frequently see that within the bureaucracy, you have small little fiefdoms where people feel like, you know, the little territory that they work in is to be protected as opposed to the idea of sharing information across the state. There are so many synergies which so frequently get replicated because of these turf wars within bureaucracy. Actually addressing that and wanting to reform that is crucial, but we also acknowledge that you know there needs to be a wider public buy-in for that need because ultimately politicians frequently look at civil service reform as being a political kryptonite, as sort of completely undermining their next election. So there needs to be some realization there, otherwise the country is going to be stuck with the bureaucracy that it has, which is a bureaucracy that also enormously disincentivizes the most talented people to really engage. So Asuka, what is your outlook for Sri Lanka for the rest of the year? Um, 
I think one of the concerns is that uh, now, um, I mean, the policy agenda has really sort of um, come to a halt in a way. There may be uh, uh, opportunities that uh, the government will try to sort of bestow a whole host of, um, shall we call them, sort of uh, treats on the, um, uh, on the public. But I think the uh, economic sort of fundamentals sort of give a stark message. You know, our state needs to contract in its expenditure on certain areas. Um, our state-owned enterprises, which are hemorrhaging money, uh, need to be really addressed directly. Um, and the fact that tourism receipts and things are going to be sort of uh, struggling over the coming year, hopefully not a lot, a lot more beyond that, but th there will be challenges. Um, I think politically, probably the most important thing to uh, monitor are looking at things around um, the special high courts which have been created. Um, uh, we can see that there are key sort of uh, political cases which are coming before the special high courts. I think it's very important that those special high courts really publicly justify why certain cases come to the special high courts and why other cases don't. You know, because that justification is key because otherwise these special high courts will purely be serving a political um, uh, uh, function and that is something to really be guarded against. But the, uh, but the progress with before these special high courts could have very serious consequences for the upcoming presidential elections and the candidates and other things which may come forward there. But I think um, I would like to also say that, you know, uh, my view is all, also not a view of despair. Um, there, is, there is inevitably going to be a next generation of people who have to take this country forward whether they will be able to come forward in the short term or the medium term is the question but they will definitely come forward and some of those people are people who understand the world a bit more than the people who are currently running this country so I mean we have to start looking for the people to place faith in for the future I know that lots of people feel that our system is a system that corrupts people and finally the good that is in them will be watered down. But I also would like to say that our people are people with a great deal of aspiration as well. You know, people are now consuming information in new ways. Um, the person who is, was uh, plucking a coconut one generation ago and before, their child is now consuming information on YouTube and aspiring to something more. So the aspirations of the young people of this country should not be underestimated. And finally, in the same way that our political culture reflects our society at the moment, our political culture will have to evolve to reflect the new aspirations of our people. It is, it is inevitable. So I, I anchor some hope in that, but whether that hope will be recognized in the short term or the medium term is the, is the question in hand. So let's keep our fingers crossed then. Thank you so much, Asuk. Thanks a lot. With pleasure. Thank you. We've been speaking about the state of the nation with the Executive Director of Transparency International Sri Lanka, Asoka Obesekara. On the other side, we have Anushan Severaja. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcasts, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Eight thousand five hundred done. Thousand five hundred go. Ooh, rah! What on earth are you doing? I'm making money! You're crazy! Crazy for money! <laughs> 10,000 steps done! Who oh, the man! I do it every single day! Show me the money! So, 
you run 10,000 steps every day, huh? you must be fit. <laughs> Some days I do 20,000. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushin Sarvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the LMB Nielsen Business Confidence Index. Joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharang Pan. Welcome back to the show, Sharang. Now, uh, to start off, how has the BCI fared? So, Anushan, the country is uh, slowly but gradually coming back from the tragedy we saw in the month of April. Sentiments are looking slightly on the positive side. There's a lot of effort that the industry as well as the authorities are putting in reviving the sentiments, be it through various forums or be it through programs they are especially running in the media. As a result, we have seen a slight uptick from where the number was last time. Uh, last time's number was around 66, 67, which was 11 year low. From there, now we have moved the, we have seen the business confidence index moving up to 81. So that's a pretty significant jump, I would say. Uh, having said that, the consumers or the citizens are still a bit wary of the situation. Maybe that's more to do with the possibility of ethnic clashes rather than what happened in the month of April. As a result, they are still holding back when it comes to their spends or their sentiments and the consumer confidence is remaining at the level of last month, which was at 36. So what do you have to say when it comes to uh, prospects in terms of business and investments? So talking about the economy, uh, one in 10 business leaders are now saying that the econ economy will move only in one direction, which is upwards. So there is some bit of uh, change, positive change over there. Talking about business performance, again, there's an improvement over there. So one in four are talking about the coming year to be positive for their businesses and even the next three months to pick up to some extent compared to the first quarter or early part of the second quarter. On the investment fronts, it is still a go slow. About 90% of the leaders still feel it is not the right time to invest more money into the market. So they are willing to go business as usual rather than upping the investment at this point of time. When they say that the economy can only go up, does this mean that they believe that we're at rock bottom and that we can't get any worse? Yes, possibly that's the reason. Uh, we've seen that in terms of the GDP numbers as well. Q4 2018 was at 1.8, one of the lowest in the last five to six years. Q1 2019 has improved significantly and the GDP growth was around 3.7%. Look at the other factors like the currency, it is still very stable despite the challenges. Look at the export performance, export has done well in Q1, there might be a dip in Q2 because of April and May the work not happening, but Q1 was still very positive and imports have also dipped at the same time. So all in all, this is possibly the reason why leaders feel the worst has gone by and it can only move slightly in the positive direction going forward. So what are the most pressing business and national issues then? So the national issues are still around what happens in the politics or political arena. They are looking for stability and uh, about 60% of the leaders call out that as the topmost national concern. There are other concerns which are emerging uh, beyond poverty, beyond corruption, which is more around ethnic clashes, which is what is being spoken about the most at this point of time. So it needs to be seen how the authorities avoid any such incidents. Talking about business concerns, uh, so uh, from the first quarter wherein inflation and taxes were spoken about by 100% of the respondents, that number has now come down to about 60% of the leaders talking about these two as the major concerns. Apart from that, the other business concerns still remain the same. So there's no change as such over there. What would be your predictions for the BCI going forward, Sharan? Uh, predictions, so with the uh, elections coming up very soon, uh, I think there are certain policy changes being done on the positive side. So we know for a fact that tourism industry is getting the impetus through policy changes, which is good. We are hoping there will be certain other changes done on the investment side, which will attract, uh, first of all, give certain uh, security guarantee and then make sure investments come in. Uh, with those changes, uh, we are expecting the confidence levels to move up gradually. 
needs to be seen how much time it takes to move up to 100 first as the first milestone and then back again to the average ranges of 120. Thank you very much for joining us, Sharan. Thank you, Anushan. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharan Pant. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal. LMD Podcasts now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Sarvaraja. Now for a close look at the latest on the economy. Joining me is economist and LMD columnist Shiran Fernando. Welcome back to the show, Shiran. Now, uh, how, where does the country stand in terms of its public and external debt? So, numbers coming out from 2018 has shown, you know, public debt as a percent of GDP going up to close to about 92%. Uh, now, that's a big rise from the 80% that was uh, that in the previous year. And, I mean, followed by, you know, the low growth rate, the exchange rate, depreciation, we saw 28, all those reasons. But overall, it does indicate, uh, you know, a bit of a problem in terms of it being very high. Of course, there are countries who have debt way above their GDP, countries like uh, Japan, uh, and even in uh, countries like even America, there are very high, high kind of G uh, debt to GDP kind of ratios. Uh, but it's how you sort of manage uh, both your short term debt that's maturing and also over the medium term. Um, so while this has been a generally a debate in a in, in lot of forums, uh, one of the key structural areas of the IMF program has been to work with the central bank and develop a medium-term uh, framework. Uh, so they put it out uh, in early April, and that maps out between now to 2023 in terms of how they hope to structure it, both in terms of the exposure and in terms of some of the instruments that are coming through. Uh, so while, I mean, it's great to have a plan in, in place, I think we need to know what the more specific things are and how that will be executed because recently we also saw the uh, central bank going out and uh, raising another 2.5 billion debt. Uh, so that was five to 10 years as well, but you're also borrowing now for your short term as well. Um, so how that is executed will be uh, a, a key thing and that needs to be monitored as between now to 2023. What are the external shocks that our currency could face going forward, Shiran? So right now, if you look at the global economy, it's in a bit of a, not a sweet spot, but uh, an area which is somewhat favorable to Sri Lanka, uh, at least on the global financial side. So we're seeing a weaker dollar uh, playing out. We're also seeing uh, money still flowing into markets like Sri Lanka. Uh, but on the, on the growth and demand side of it, we're seeing some of the issues from global demand uh, and global growth so, sort of coming off and some of the uh, institutions cutting down their growth numbers as well. Uh, so. While the currency has mm, has appreciated this year, while well, some of it is a bit of a correction compared to what the steep fall we saw last year, um, it's it, there isn't too much of a pressure right now. Another factor that has been uh, occurring supporting the rupee has been the decline in imports that we've seen from November last year till the latest data, which is April, uh, and that has really supported the rupee uh, in an environment where the exports are also rising. Um, so in the second half of this year, it will be interesting to see whether A, uh, the global situation gets better and B, whether this import trend, a uh, declining trend continues. If both factors uh, work in the same way as it has been in the last few months, then there is uh, definitely uh, less pressure on the rupee to depreciate. But if, you know, even the global factors change uh, uh, negatively, even slightly for Sri Lanka, then I think the currency will uh, be under pressure. Now you said that uh, the exports are doing well and this in turn is helping our currency. But are exports growing fast enough though? So exports have been, uh, I think, consistently uh, rising uh, over the last few months and over the last 12 months. Um, a lot of the growth has also come from exports to uh, the EU. Uh, so I think on the apparel side, very much it's dependent on the demand side, what's going on with uh, the European Union and the demand side there. Uh, but the other exports we are also noticing uh, going up. Commodities like tea, I think, with the prices falling uh, as well, there has been a slight reduction. Uh, but things like fisheries, things like that are picking up. So 
in, in that context, exports of goods have been going up. Exports of services, I think, is something that we usually don't talk about as well, but that has been also consistently rising with ITC services and other related services also uh, rising as well. So I think uh, the mix of both, uh, the, the trend is positive. But if the global scenario changes quite adversely and, you know, these demand side impacts see, for example, contraction in growth rates or a hint towards recession, then our exporters might feel a bit of the pinch. Thank you very much for joining us, Shiran. Thank you. That was Economist and LMD columnist Shiran Fernando. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.